Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, or very biased collection as usual. Today, one of my uh, favorite topics of all time, um, so computational topology. So topology and its applications. Um, the precise topic here, you can read it, we'll see what it is. But kind of what I feel why the computational topology is so absolutely fantastic is that, well, when you first learn topology, it looks so abstract. Uh, you might learn first set point topology, which is by its very birth, essentially, a very abstract, but also algebraic topology is quite abstract, or differential topology is also quite abstract. Topology in general um, is often part of what is called abstract nonsense, whatever that means, whatever abstract nonsense means. But it's certainly not clear if you're uh, younger, <laughs> and certainly you're, you're yeah, way younger than I am, um, that why topology should be applicable anywhere. It's just abstract nonsense. And then you hit more and more applications of topology in mathematics, and eventually you hit more and more applications of topology in real life. And this is really what topo topological data science or whatever, um, part of what I'm going to show you here is all about. It's kind of topology in real life. And it really absolutely makes sense. It's quite easy to explain. And I kind of feel, always feel like, and this not just happens with topology. There are many, many other fields of the same flavor. And I often feel like um, at least the education system I was educated in was a little bit backwards because we were kind of, I was educated to be a, kind of a fool. I was just a really, really like focused on some abstract nonsense. And it was absolutely unclear why this should be applicable anywhere. Why it's, it's on the same time, it's actually super applicable. So mathematics is literally everywhere in the sciences. So something is somehow not quite optimal uh, in mass education. I'm not saying I have any idea how to do it better. In some sense, you of course need to learn linear algebra abstractly, but um, yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit shameful or a little bit of a pity, maybe shameful. What does shameful mean? It's a little bit of a pity that we learn about applications so late. So today I would like to focus on a branch of topology, which is so applicable and actually shows how topology is applicable. And it actually goes further. I'm just kind of discussing the tip of the iceberg, but there's just a really, really large um, part underneath the water, uh, so where you have applications of even abstract concepts like homology or whatever. But for now, I stay with alpha shapes and alpha complexes. I should say I don't quite know where the name comes from. Uh, shape and complex, that's fine, but where does alpha come from? I'm not quite sure. We'll have an alpha, but uh, otherwise, shape and complex is the main word. And all I'm thinking about, so this is now the alpha shape, and alpha is the radius of a little ball. Alpha is always a radius of some ball. Anyway, so essentially what you should think of is that you have a collection of points, like data you collect, and you want to know what kind of shape does your data form. So maybe you should think of a little bit of like birds in the sky, every bird is a point. Uh, maybe the birds form this shape, birds also like to form this shape, for example, and you kind of want to recognize what type of what type of shape it is. Here, uh, my birds, my points form uh, the letter R. And I kind of want to recognize what it is and there should be some smart ways of doing this. And while saying this, and um, we'll solve, solve that in a certain sense by using topology, while saying this, it's kind of obvious why this is an interesting problem in real life. So uh, yeah, sure, the data might have shape. That's not really hard to explain. That's can not all data has shape, obviously, but some data might have shape. And yeah, and topology is the study of shapes. So there you go. There should be some uh, connection here. And OK, we have the fixed radius alpha. And the alpha shape, well, whatever it is, it's either this one or this one depends a little bit. So the, what you do is you, you, you take the union of all balls of that radius that do not contain any of your points and take the complement of that. So the uh, whatever it is, the uh, pink shape here is what I get. And I just straighten out the edges, and that's how you go to this shape. So I said again, you take all balls that don't hit any point, and the, the radius is fixed. That's why you always get those little arcs here, because the radius is fixed, right? And you take the complement of that. And up to straightening of edges, because this is a bit annoying, they have, by definition, arcs as edges. Uh, you just straighten them out, and you get a pretty good approximation, actually, of the letter R, in this case. and 
I won't discuss this, but it turns out that this is actually a really good approximation of the shape of a data. So that's called the alpha complex, sorry, the alpha shape, right? So it doesn't make sense. You take kind of bolts that do not hit the picture and take them out and whatever, you, whatever remains is your shape. Okay, and then there's the alpha complex. It's another way of approximating the letter R, as you can see here, works pretty well. And it is done as follows. So now every point is kind of a dual picture. So now every point is now the center of a disk of radius alpha. It's still our disk of radius alpha here. And you connect points uh, if they are kind of if their disks over overlap. So here, this disk here uh, goes somewhere here, and it, it overlaps with this disk. So you draw an edge between them. So this disk intersects this disk, this disk, and this disk. So you draw the corresponding edges here. And whenever you get out of this, it's called the alpha complex. And again, it approximates your shape really, really well, actually. So um, as you can see, that's not a bad approximation of the letter R. So, and again, of course, the idea is that you want to approximate your birds and you want to figure out what shape it is, right? It's the same type of question and you have two natural answers. So a good question is, how are those related? Right? They don't look very different, right? So here uh, they are in comparison. They look actually quite similar. They're not equal. They're not equal. They're constructed very differently. In particular, if you think about this problem in higher dimensions, it gets a bit trickier to imagine anyway. But they look pretty similar, right? So is there any relation between the two? Because eventually um, you can use either of them if you can show something like they have the same type of shape, whatever that means. And that's exactly what my main theorem is all about now. Uh, obviously, it's not my theorem. It's just the main theorem of this uh, little video here is that they are homotopy equivalent, which is kind of the best you can hope for as a statement in topology. I'm going to explain it in a second. So homotopy equivalence is this idea of shrinking something to a spine. Just think of the letter A, just a, a thickened letter A. Can I draw a thickened letter A? Maybe I can, we'll see. And the uh, this homotopy equivalent to its spine. That's right? so a little bit the, the red part in the blue part. Similar for B and C. And you can actually uh, sort the alphabet by its homotopy equivalence. And you get genus zero things, essentially everything without, uh, without a little hole here. Uh, the C, for example, the genus is just a number of holes. Uh, you have the one with holes. There are only six of them, and you have only one letter with two holes. And this is our friend B here. Okay, and everything works in higher dimensions. Also, that gets a little bit tricky to prove. So it's not. I'm not saying this is an easy proof. Um, and now you're wondering, okay, they are homotopy equivalent. But let's go back. It's kind of the best statement you can hope for. Let me let me say why. So why are they not homeomorphic. So if you're familiar with topology, you might know that the correct notion in topology in some sense is a notion of homeomorphism. So if a continuous map with a continuous inverse, um, they're not homeomorphic because of fluctuations that happen like here. So it could be, so um, homeomorphism cannot collapse dimensions, right? So uh, if for one of them, you would have just this one and for the other one, you would have a little spine around here, then they would be homotopy equivalent, but they won't be homeomorphic because homeomorphism does not collapse dimensions. So in some sense, the only reason why they're not homeomorphic are those little fluctuations here along the boundary where you don't really have a, a full dimension anymore, right? It's not of dimension two, it's just a dimension one thing. Um, and it just kind of can vary with alpha kind of uh, very subtly. So that's why homotopy equivalent where you're allowed to collapse those to the spine, it's kind of the best you can hope for. Um, as a notion of classical topology, if you want to beef that up, you can actually beef that up and you get a notion somewhere in between a homeomorphism and homotopy equivalent. But I think that's a pretty cool statement because um, by construction, they're constructed very differently. So either here on the right-hand side, you take uh, a ball around each point, or here you gotta do the opposite. You take a ball and cut out everything else, which is kind of the, really the opposite. And you end up with um, two, let me just say homeomorphic shapes. Keep in mind that they're not quite homeomorphic. You see this little fluctuation here. So here and here, it gets very tricky depending on alpha. So this might blow up into a little 
um, depending on alpha and for a little, uh, uh, in this case, um, face, or it kind of collapses to a line. So it gets a little bit subtle around the boundary, and that's why you don't have a real homomorphism. But anyway, let's ignore that and let's just say they are the same shape topologically, yeah. which is, I think, a pretty cool statement. Again, those things turn up in real in the real world. Obviously, like think of a, a protein, for example. Protein, by definition, if you want, have, has lots of those little balls, uh, like the the nucleus, and then some kind of cloud around it, and you can easily model them using alpha complexes or alpha shapes and there's a union of balls and here's this these guys are called van der Waals diagrams but anyway so you can easily imagine some great application in uh, the real world and it is just good to know that kind of it doesn't matter which one you take uh, the one where you cut off balls or the one where you just construct uh, balls around each point anyway the main message here of this video is not maybe so much the theorem but a reminder um, that really most of mathematics actually is quite applicable. You'd be surprised how applicable category theory is in computer science, for example. A topology for the study of proteins or birds or something. It, it's really, really fantastic. And we sometimes tend to forget how actually applicable mathematics is. And kind of that's part of why it is so, beauty, why it is so beautiful. Not, not because we forget about it, but because it's so applicable. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.